Okay, okay. Settle down there. We have plenty of time for discussion um, <laughs> as we go on. So welcome everybody to Hidden in the Algorithm. Uh, I'm very excited, I feel very honored to be, uh, be hosting this. This is a hugely important topic. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, you, all, you hear a lot about algorithms and how they are increasingly running our lives. You know, often that can be a positive thing. We, you know, everything from helping us get a taxi more efficiently or recommending a new movie uh, to increasingly important decisions uh, that, that are going to happen more and more, such as making key uh, calls about our medical care, um, you know, judicial decisions and hiring decisions. But it's become more and more apparent, I think, to the public especially, that algorithms can be unfair, can, can express some form of bias. And you know, whether that's how they're designed or whether it's because of the way they are being trained or the data they've been trained on, I should say, they can internalize bias and express that. And that can be a, a hugely important issue. Uh, in her excellent book, Weapons of Math Destruction, Cathy O'Neill talks about this and explains how it can sort of form a pernicious kind of uh, feedback loop, whereas people are relying on algorithms and trusting in them more and more uh, to make decisions that are biased, and then that kind of reaffirms that bias. So it's a, it's a really important, really big civilizational scale challenge, and we have four fantastic speakers here to, to help you make sense of that to, and to help us hopefully come up with some, some ideas for how to, to, to cope with it. So let me go ahead and introduce our speakers. So next to me here we have Joanna Bryson. She is a professor at the University of Bath in the UK. She's done pioneering work on ethics and artificial intelligence and is quite famous within the field for doing some work on how the natural language systems that AI systems are trained on, sorry, the natural language data sets that AI systems are trained on can in, uh, or naturally express bias, including gender bias and so forth. Um, so very excited to have her, thank you. Uh, next we have Frida Poli, who is co-founder and chief executives of Pymetrics. This is, I was just learning about this company, very, very exciting. They are using cognitive neuroscience, which she had to just explain to me, and <laughs> machine learning to try and do to try and help companies hire more fairly so she's working on addressing bias in in uh, a, a, a situation which is commonly biased uh, and, and and kind of solve that uh, next to her we have Lauren Woodman who is chief executive officer of NetHope a company that is looking to uh, find ways to provide technology or guide NGOs to use technology, so in all sorts of important situations. And next to her, we have Robert Grin, who is, leading, who is uh, the chief executive of a company called Codewise in Poland, one of the fastest growing ad tech companies in the world. And he was explaining to me that they are increasingly relying on, or looking to rely on data science, machine learning algorithms to make decisions. So he's uh, conscious of this, this challenge and how to, to deal with it. Uh, and I, before we proceed, I want to um, highlight a question that, that we're going to try and answer today, which is, how can we use algorithms? How, as a society, can we use algorithms while also trying to make them less biased or less unfair? So let's, let's before, we, before we get into the meat of that, let's uh, try and unravel what we're, what, what we're talking about, because perhaps not everybody is familiar with what an algorithm really is. <laughs> and Joanna, the honor falls to you to, to help us make sense of that. Right. And perhaps you can put it in context in terms of artificial intelligence generally. Right, okay. So uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, this is a question I get quite often, so I will uh, do my best to, to be clear about it. Um, whenever we talk about definitions, uh, it's not really worth arguing about it. I'm not going to say that this is a definition everybody uses, but it's a way to be very, very clear, all right? So intelligence, the most essential part of intelligence is that you take a current context and you produce an action, all right? So this is a definition we use both in uh, ethology the, or uh, behavioral ecology, so the animal side, and also it's the original definition you would find in the Patrick Winston books of artificial intelligence, right? So just going from context sensing to you know, perception into action. All right, what is artificial intelligence? 
Artificial intelligence is inte something that's intelligent, that's an artifact, which seems reduction, but <laughs> it means someone is responsible for it. Somebody built it, and it's something produced by us. Otherwise, there's not much difference. And when people tell you that there may be some you know, magic thing that only humans can do, maybe. All right. So an algorithm is the means by which it's a set of steps that you go through to go from the perception to the action. Now, uh, when I was taught this in computer science, we used to say that it was like a recipe. And there is absolutely algorithms that humans have to do too. For example, when a judge has to give a minimum sentence because the law has set up an algorithm that the judge has to follow. Machines are very good at following those rules. One of the important things about humans is we can sometimes bend the rules when, they, when we need to. Um, uh, and then finally, I should say, of course, famously machine learning is one of the ways that people are constructing algorithms. Now, this isn't the kind of algorithm that we used to talk about programming, that you step through a set of steps. You suddenly are saying, rather than trying to understand everything we do, we take uh, data to show us um, in this context, we wanted this action. And you just try to learn enough examples so that you can recognize appropriately which uh, uh, aspect of the context mattered and then to get the correct action out of it. So now, in fact, Cathy O'Neill is one of the people who says, oh, algorithms are learned. And, and she, that's how she describes it, which is not accurate in computer science, but anyway, so you know, there are multiple ways to use these words. And would you say one of the reasons why you know, there's so much attention around this idea of algorithms is because there, there is all this data, increasingly companies are data driven, uh, and they're, you know, they're just kind of, can apply, compu can apply computing to key decisions. Well, there's no question that uh, artificial intelligence has become much more visible recently. Mm. And this started, it's been going gradually for a very long time, since the 50s, in the 1950s. I mean, already people used machine learning to be able to play checkers better than humans could play checkers, like back in the 1950s, right? It's, so it's not that it's totally new, mm -hmm. but a lot of people think actually the advent of the smartphone is part of the reason that things have changed in the last decade, because we got so much more data about people. But you know, Google was a big deal in the late 90s. I mean, really, this stuff has been coming, and I think it's because too many people mistakenly think that to be intelligent is to be like human that they think we didn't have AI when it was already changing our society. So they thought, I know what AI is. It looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? <laughs> it doesn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It isn't going to have, uh, it, it's here. It's already in your phones that you're playing with right now instead of listening to the boring <laughs> talks, right? <laughs> it's, it's there, and it's changing the world, um, and, it's, and it doesn't have desires like humans have or any evolved species. It doesn't care about um, penalties of law, it doesn't mind being isolated, that it's, it's just algorithms. It is just mechanical ways of going from perception to action. Now, the, the, the study that you talked about before, mm -hmm. we showed that just a very simple algorithm that just counts how words appear next to each other, it's basically a glorified spreadsheet that it shows exactly the same biases as the human implicit biases that were measured by um, by, by psychologists looking at uh, how fast you could push buttons, you know, very like uncontrolled, not your explicit biases, but your implicit biases. Um, so I, I feel like I'm taking a very long no, turn okay. here. No, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, so this okay. is essentially this is, meaning things like Siri and Alexa do have a kind of biased view of well, the world as expressed through their what language. What was right? exciting about our paper, we used machine learning to show that the bias was there, but the bias was there in the words. Right. So it means we may be passing on our biases to our children without even knowing it and without, and without explicitly believing it, because it's just the way we use words. Right. And so that, I'll, I will finish then with, the, <laughs> with one thing that is very important to understand. So, you can have bias because you use bad data, that there's something wrong with the data. You, what we showed is you can have bias using all the data in the world. We used the whole internet, well, the English language internet. But then we got American kinds of biases, including the truth about uh, some of our sexist uh, word vectors, that's what they were called, word vectors. Some of our sexist AI accurately could predict what proportion of the people who had a job were women. Mm -hmm. So it's sexist to say programmers are men, 
but it's also a fact to say that most programmers are men. Right. Um, but then finally, there, that's two ways you can get bias. The third way is someone can deliberately program it in. So never forget that A and AI is artificial. It's an artifact, and people can choose how to design it. Right, right. Frida, so you're looking at correcting for the bias that's built into a lot of people's, well, <laughs> everyone's heads. Um, so how do, you, how do you go out addressing sure. this, this yeah. challenge? Can I make one comment about what Joanna oh, please, said, yeah, which is totally relevant? Have you heard of a startup called Textio? No. So Textio is really interesting because it does the inverse of what you're talking about. It will actually go through a job ad and tell you how gender or ethnic biased it is and then it will correct your words so that it is unbiased. And they have these great case studies of, you know, uh, you know it, it's, it's chicken and the egg, right? Why are there more men programmers? Because the ads are for, you know, ninja warriors. Well, women don't apply to ads that talk about ninja warriors, right? But if you correct it, um, then you get more equally proportioned applicants. So this is a segue into what we do, which is, we are a company that uses behavioral neuroscience and AI to help companies hire in a more predictive and fair way. And so what does that mean? What it means is two things. So my background is I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. Cognitive neuroscientists across the globe have discovered ways to essentially look at people's um, cognitive and emotional traits, things like memory, attention, planning, risk profile, reward profile, and so on. And instead of using resume data, which is known to have a lot of issues, um, we use that data when assessing somebody's potential for a job. So why does that matter? It matters because you can, that data is a lot less biased than resume data. So back to the idea that the data you're collecting on someone can actually impact the decisions you're making. So that data set that we have is a lot less biased. It's not completely free, but it's a lot less biased. And then the second thing that we do is we train our algorithms on successful people in a company. Now, oftentimes that group of people is not as diverse as we would like. It may be overly male, it may be overly Caucasian. It really depends on the job. Sometimes it's the inverse. So then what we do is when we have a biased training set, we'll, or anytime we build an algorithm, we'll essentially test the algorithm on a reference group of people where we know their gender and ethnicity, we can give them scores, and we can look for statistical differences between men and women and people of different ethnic backgrounds. And if we find those differences, we'll go back, because we use explainable AI, not a black box, we can go back and sort of trace where this bias is coming from and de-weight or potentially even remove that input until the, the algorithm is not showing a statistically significant difference between those two groups. So again, it's a situation where your input data may not be unbiased, but through design, you can create a situation where that's mitigated. And again, we've seen companies, um, we were just talking about this, where the results of the recruiting process after implementing our technology, just like after implementing Texio, where the gender and ethnic proportion is, becomes more, much more balanced. So you're, you're doing this very responsibly. Obviously, you're, you're trying to account for the bias. There are a lot of startups doing automated hiring. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like a lot of those quite probably are just automating the bias, would you, yeah. would, is that right? I mean, that is definitely true. I think what I would say is that it's sort of the ostrich in the sand problem that I think a lot of the startups that are doing automated hiring, and by the way, you know, we would be included in that, are not necessarily checking or looking to see if their decision-making right. processes are biased. And so if you're not looking, they could be, they, they might not be, but they very well could be. And so it's just a question of that I think that it sort of is incumbent upon us as technologists to at least know what's in there. And if we find something that we don't like, we should change it. Right, right. Well, let's, let's bring in Lauren and Robert. You're working in the, uh, the NGO space, and Robert, you're working in the private sector. Um, what are, you, are, you, are you seeing people take, taking much notice of this? Are they really trying to, to address it? Lauren, what are you? Yeah, I think this question for us in the, in the international humanitarian and development space is a really critical one, because one of the, the questions that we look at is how do we use technology most effectively to figure out how we solve some of these really tough problems, right? I mean, we've got, um, you know, children that need better medical care. We've got, you know, the prevention of chronic diseases in, in countries where there aren't particularly good health care systems to support them. We've got, you know, environmental concerns. And there are any, any number of questions against which um, some of these complex um, systems and the, and the broad data sets may actually help us understand um, better interventions and better ways to address these problems. And there's tremendous amounts of pro promise if we look at those data sets that NGOs have been collecting for eons and eons and, and start to analyze those and figure out, okay, how do we actually do this work better? 
So on the, that's on the upside, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and we spent a lot of time being optimistic about uh, how that, that might be applied. The challenge is, is that we're also very worried about the bias that's built into those questions. And, and, um, and, and to be fair, whether or not there is bias built into those questions or whether or not bias is created by the data sets that we're using in order to get there and how do we mitigate against that. And mm -hmm. so while there's a whole lot of promise, there's also a lot of questions and, and risk that we recognize around the data sets that are being used, around the way that algorithms are written, around whether or not um, the way that those systems are developed are taking into account the, the ethical considerations that are first and foremost in our minds right. when we think about you know, interventions into society. And then on the, on the other side, whether or not the nonprofit community and, and the stakeholders with which we work, policymakers and community leaders and whatnot, actually have the capabilities and the skill set to evaluate whether or not the algorithms that are being used to make decisions on their behalf are in fact fair and, and um, don't have bias built into them. Are there situations where it's more, more complex to figure out what is fair? I mean, there, there are lots of situations where we can probably all agree, but there must be cases where it's, it's, it's uh, more challenging. Is that something you, you come across? It, it absolutely is, right? Yeah. Um, it absolutely is. And I think any time you start to look at more and more complex data sets um, you know, for more and more diverse populations, there are open questions. And you know, the, the example I always talk about, and it's not dissimilar from the experiences that we've had with facial recognition software, right? The, 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 the data in determines the, the validity of the data out. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing, you know, that facial recognition software doesn't work very well if you're use that for, I don't know, you know, getting into the lab at, at, the, at the company with which you, at which you work. It's a very different thing if you're making decisions um, about the healthcare outcomes of children if 70% of the kids in your country don't have birth records, mm -hmm. you know? And so those are very, very different um, questions around impact. And so we want to make sure that um, as the complexity grows, as the um, as the, the, the variety of data sets that we're looking at and the quality of data sets that we're looking at is that we actually know how um, to mitigate against that or we're taking steps to recognize that there may be limitations in the outcomes and, and at least that we are aware of those outcomes right. um, and, and we aren't just unilaterally making you know, automated decisions that may have very dire consequences. Right. Joanna, do you, do you want to weigh in on that? Because you were, you were nodding when I was saying that, you know, that, that it's more complicated. How, how, how do we figure out what is fair, even in those situations, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I should, I, I'll defer. I mean, I, I just know that it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would, when, I, when we published this paper, to me it was a, a science thing. I was really interested in how human minds worked. So I was very interested in the fact that implicit bias is something you could get um, from, from, uh, from large corpus linguistics. It was an interesting thing. But then people really got angry at me and said, but if you have the bias in your AI, now you can fix it. <laughs> and, and they're like, one of the solutions, now this is sort of a technical thing, but, but uh, sometimes you can make your AI better if you just uh, give it uh, random noise. It's a strange thing, but it's, it's just like sometimes uh, a learning system will get stuck. This is actually the principle by which they used to do electroconvulsive therapy to, to brains, that sometimes you just kind of get stuck. So they'd say, oh, just add noise to your, your, your learning systems, you'll fix it. Well, in this case, adding noise means eliminating information. It just means like, oh, if you make it say less and less and less, then it's fair. And I'm like, your definition of fair is that there's no world, there's no structure, there's just entropy. That's the fairest thing. I'm like, that's not a very useful definition of fair. Right, right. But, but there are people that go out and they try to say, let's, let's uh, ask lots of people what they think is fair, right? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, are we gonna use democracy? I don't know a single person that would agree to having the current president of America and the previous President of America both get to decide what words mean. You know, that's not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they, so democracy doesn't seem like the best answer. Um, looking at the current state of the world, again, depends on the previous states of the world. And so there has been historic biases that we don't want to perpetuate. Yeah. So my current theory of fairness is that it's an ideal that we negotiate and discuss right. and that we're constantly striving for and redefining. 
But a lot of people thought it was just something that was there that we've fallen away from, you know, that this, this biblical kind of yeah. falling story. But it's not like there was something that was just there. And interestingly, if you were to take the bias completely out of the, those language systems, they might have a poorer comprehension of language, right? Which is, which well, is kind of... Bias, okay, this is, again, what we call the bad bias, the, the sexism, for example, is stereotypes. That's a technical right. term. In, but bias in itself just means it's a regularity. And so if you're talking about machine learning, if there was no bias, there's nothing. There's, right. no, there's no information. It's just about regularities. But some of the regularities are ones that our society has decided should no longer persist. Okay, well, that's a good reason to bring in Robert, well, if I may. Oh, sorry. Do you, you, go ahead, well, no, Frida. I, I think it's a little different, uh, honestly, the way we think about bias. I, I understand what you're saying, but I actually think there is a difference between bias and signal. I mean, I think what you're saying is that a bias technically could be viewed as signal, right, or a signal is bias. But the way that I think about it, so for example, there are lots of great studies that were done where people using a resume would actually hire a less qualified Caucasian or male over a more qualified uh, female, right? right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's clearly bias, right? Um, because if you're, you've got some metrics you're hiring people on and you're choosing somebody who's less qualified by those metrics, you're, that's not adhering to some sort of regularity. It's, so I think, no, but can I, sorry, can I just finish? So I think that, and when you have a data set of people that have been chosen based on those methods, that is actually noise to the system, right? In the sense that, you know, humans are using their implicit bias to hire more Caucasians, whereas there's lots of other people that are not Caucasian that are just as qualified and maybe more qualified. And yet the adding of Caucasians to this population is actually noise. And so it's decreasing what could be a real signal, right? So I actually think that you can disentangle these things. Well, I, so so, I'm gonna, I, I, so this is the, the arguing about definitions again. I think I think okay. we should drop it's, it. It's <laughs> Possibly, an, but it's an important yeah. point. It's, yeah. It is an important point because we, you know, this is this is what everyone's wrestling with. And I, I want to bring in Robert because you're a businessman. You're looking to do more automation automation of your your ad business. Yes. And uh, how we, you know, to some degree, without getting too much into the definitions, like a machine learning system is by trying to make biased calls, right? Um, by how you how you define it. How you, how you, is this just an annoying thing you're, you're having to think about? <laughs> I wouldn't use the word annoying, uh, but uh, by definition, the, the industry that I operate in, advertising technology, a company's success is defined by its ability to target people who will be engaged in an advertisement and exclude people who may not be. Mm -hmm. And it's such a hyper-competitive industry that we are, uh, we're on the forefront of machine learning. We're, we're building out our data science team. Every ad you see on your telephone, on your computer, it's shown to you essentially by a machine. A machine decides uh, whether or not it thinks you'll engage with the ad. And so with the vast amounts of data that we have, it's, uh, it's an incredibly you know, lucrative uh, industry, but it's dominated by Facebook and Google because they have more data than anyone else. Um, and when it comes to you know, fairness and all that, I think we need to take a step back and look at things from the public eye. I think there's, a, there's an issue with awareness. People don't understand what data is being collected about them. Uh, people don't understand how it's being utilized to make decisions that impact their daily lives. You know, in our, in our industry, it may be someone isn't shown an ad, which could be a big deal. Even recently, Facebook was sued for not displaying, a, a, I think it was an ad for some sort of executive position to women. Um, and women accused, you know, uh, sort of a male bias in, mm -hmm. in that situation. But perhaps, like Joanna said, it's more likely those algorithms determine that a male is more likely to respond to that advertisement. So is that bias or not? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. But for example, the GDPR movement, I had to implement that as an entrepreneur. It was cumbersome, but I know it was, uh, it was necessary. It was an a inevitable first step in you know, making the public aware of what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. um, and the EU is at the forefront of, of, of that whole movement. And I, I, I would be even willing to bet that most EU citizens do not know that they now have the right to make a decision. I didn't know that until recently. Right. Um, and then I'm sure even less know which decisions are actually automated, made by machines. So it's a, it's a matter of educating the public and just making them more aware, I think. Right, right. Um, Frida, I really love the idea of, of you know, trying to counteract human bias. 
Are you, do you think that is going to become more and more common? You're, you're obviously doing it in a very prominent area, mm -hmm. but is it? I, I, I know others. Some researchers are working on like trying to counteract um, the bias in the decisions judges make, for mm -hmm. example. Could we could could we end up doing this in our everyday lives and having a system that helps us try and counteract our own bias? Well, I mean, I think that you know to the point that was just made about GDPR, I think the more scrutiny you have of automated decision making, the more people will have to explain their decisions. And therefore, as a result, I think there will be more emphasis on correcting bias if it's found, because people will get in trouble for doing that. So I actually think, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, like I think that humans, you know, we're all biased. I am, you are, everybody here is, right? And it's actually really, really hard to remove those biases from people. Um, and it's true for myself as well. And I think, and so, however, an algorithm is a string of code that you can actually change, right? <laughs> we, I can't change myself that easily. And so I think there is an optimism in my mind around how we can use these algorithms to really affect large scale change that just would be kind of difficult if we had to go around and tweak everybody, every single person's right. behavior at that level. And they're also a lot more easy to investigate, right? I mean, back to the point of recruiting, um, you're not gonna fire a person for having bias because it's just them being a human, right? That, that doesn't happen. But right. you can remove or sue a company for having an algorithmic process that's biased. So I think there's more accountability almost. Yeah, it seems, it's, I mean, do you all think that companies are kind of moving too quickly? They're certainly being held to account in some examples. There's like the computer vision systems yep. that are out there that, you know, the ACLU made this, made some great points about yep. how those are, you know, not that accurate. Do you, think comp do you think the companies delivering a lot of these kind of automated machine learning systems are moving a bit too quickly? Well, Lauren? I'm, I'm, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I mean, you know, being an entrepreneur, we're, we're profit driven. Right. Um, that's the incentive, and that's also the feedback mechanism for developing these algorithms. A programmer is not an ethicist, as Joanna. Uh, sorry, in, in the background, we're discussing the programmers rarely study eth you know, ethics as well. They're ones and zeros. They're, they like answers. And typically, the feedback mechanism you know, in the advertising space and in others is, is, is profit. Right. Um, the more profitable an algorithm, the bigger the incentive to continue down, down that path. Um, which may or may not you know, result in, in apparent bias or not. Right. So well, I got a whole yeah. lot of reactions to all of this. Um, okay. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and, 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 and they're not all necessarily negative. You know, I, so a, a couple of observations. Um, I, I, I do think there is this question of accountability that we have to address. You know? and, and in a session earlier today, actually, we were talking about you know, to, to what extent do we hold organizations, companies, whatever, accountable for the technology that they deploy, mm -hmm. especially if that technology causes harm. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it, you know, the, 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 the example that's always brought up is autonomous driving cars, right, and mm -hmm. self-driving cars. And um, is, that a, is, that a, is that a challenge of the car manufacturer? Is that the software developer? You know, and, and, and we will work those questions out. Um, the, it's, more, it's less clear to me where the, the clear line of accountability um, lies when you start talking about the interconnectedness of complex um, systems that have had a whole lot of decision making all along the way, right? right. And it and it's the it, it's the it's the early mistake that got you off two degrees, that got you off two degrees, that got you off two degrees. Before you know it, you're off ninety degrees, and we're you know this whole thing has really gone sideways. Mm -hmm. And 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 if you're talking about health systems, you're talking about you know the, the sentencing. You're talking about uh, one of the police departments that got in trouble about predicting where who was likely to be um, a violent offender, even though these people had you know no criminal records whatsoever. Right under investigation those types of things start to have huge societal implications that that you know where does that accountability lie is that yeah. is that with the the police department that deployed the technology well the you know the police department says well gosh we're not qualified you know to make decisions about whether or not this was like was good code or bad code okay well then does that sit with the with the developer so you know i think that question is huge i think we're right that, uh, that part of the challenge is that those systems are developed in, in incentive programs that are driven by the opportunity to make money and that the programmers that, that are writing that code aren't ethicists. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we ought to expect them to be ethicists. But at the same point in time, I also don't think that we can, we can just say, not my job. Yeah. You know, not my job when all of those decisions have such huge implications 
for every aspect of our life. It is one thing for me not to be shown an ad on a social network. Mm -hmm. it, you know, that, that's one challenge. It, it is another thing for me um, to not have access to opportunities, to um, not be given the right health care, to uh, not be allowed to vote, you know, whatever the case may be. And I think that it comes back to a, and this is sort of my last point, this broader question that this, these questions of accountability and transparency and capability and the intent with which we develop and deploy them leads to this question of to what extent we have trust in these systems as a society. And there is a massive question around that, um, you know, around how much we trust, decision, trust systems to make decisions on our behalf. And, and if we can't answer those questions, I don't think we solve the trust question. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I very much like, so this is something I, I'm really uh, interested in is what is the appropriate level of regulation? How do we make sure the systems are safe? And this question about the police department doesn't have the expertise to judge the code, then they shouldn't be deploying the system. They, and I'm not saying that every police person should know about you know, how to program. I'm saying that you have to have a, a civic system about deciding about going out and getting the experts to evaluate your systems. Some of these systems that are doing these really bad uh, predictions about recidivism, which is that's uh, whether or not someone is likely to reoffend if they were released from jail. No academic can make a prediction as bad as this commercial <laughs> system, right? And so you have to say to yourself, what was really going on there? Was this a deliberate choice? Again, remember that it's an artifact. And while we think that AI is this magic thing, we're in trouble. We need to follow the same standards of due diligence, and this is why I was loving what Frida is saying. We can prove due diligence even easier when we have software. We can show if we, and this just hasn't been the standard because you know computers were seen as toys for a long time, basically. But we could show, like as they are doing in the automotive industry, you know, wh why did you write the lines of code you wrote? What procedure did you follow to test it? What libraries did you link to? That is not something people currently necessarily document. What data did you train off in what order? And, and um, as, as you said, the, 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 um, while you're only motivated by profit, then that's why would you do that? But when you start worrying about lawsuits, mm. which you believe me, Microsoft already is because they've been on the wrong side of the law. They're quite open about that. That's why they're getting into AI ethics is because they're worried about liability. Yeah. Google and Facebook may very well find out about what Microsoft has already found out about. And, they're, and at least, I don't know anyone at Facebook, basically, but, I, but at Google, they are concerned. And they're saying, how can we help? How can we sign up? How can we help with this whole accountability thing? And I would add, I don't, I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing to be driven by profit, right? Oh. And so I, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's gotten us you know, enormous innovations that have huge potential. So I'm not discounting that at all. But I also think that, you know, as we've seen with lots of other social movements, right? Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, are you organic, are you recyclable, or are you whatever? It, it is not just profit, it is the ability to sell in the market. And if the ability to sell in the market is that, hey, we are transparent, here's how we went through our decision-making process, that has to be part so, of it. Yeah, but so it I think a good question is, you know, is the existing legal system yeah, this regulatory is... framework enough? And I, I'd be curious to know what what yeah. people think about that. I absolutely, if, if the laws are, so, so look at the driverless cars. Every single accident we've had so far, we can, they do t show you exactly what happened, what the machine thought, why it thought that, what it saw, what the system was. We don't have that with all the human accidents, right? right? Although but, arguably but, maybe they shouldn't be driving those cars without that. Well, no, no, no. The, the, what do you mean without that? The, the point is that they were able to catch that. Anyway, so my point is that you can do this kind of accounting with the system. Why is it so good in that? Because the automotive industry is well regulated. And let's not drop out government. Government is the means by which we enforce these kinds of costs and make sure they're equitably distributed. And as you said, advertising is hugely lucrative. Great. So the companies that have a trillion dollars some of that money has not gone through redistribution properly, and that's why we lack the infrastructure to protect our society, and then the society falls apart. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we're talking about equitably figuring out how to move the money in the right way so infrastructure is there as well as so that people are making money from Free, working hard. 
Good yeah, morning. I mean, I think it's an interesting topic as to whether there should be increased regulation or what is the right mechanism. You know, people have talked about like an FDA for algorithms or something along those lines. I mean, I don't know if that will happen. Mm -hmm. I think that they're, I, I honestly don't know. I think it's a really, it's a debated and very important topic. Um, I do think, to Joanna's point, that industries that are already regulated, whether it's hiring or automotive industries, already have those guardrails more in place um, than you know, recidivism estimates or something else where there isn't any regulatory body looking at that right now. So um, it's hard to say. I'm mm -hmm. sure we'll know more soon. Robert, I'm sure you're a fan of regulation. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> well. I would agree with you. The legal system is, is not designed to, to handle, especially a subject like AI, which will, will continue accelerating at a faster and faster pace. So legislation will, and regulation will always be a step behind innovation. Um, the only way to change that is to you know, add draconian types of fines that will just uh, be so massive that they may uh, deter such, such behavior. Uh, what you were saying, Joanne, it sounds like a flaw with capitalism. I mean, I agree, it's not a perfect system. Um, no, but it's, and it's not that flawed. I, I, to, to answer your question more directly, I don't think we need to change a lot of law. In the UK, we've decided we don't need to change a law. We just need to enforce it more and, and inform people so that they can know that they can go back and ask these questions and show us that you follow good practice. I mean, the, how, do you, the how do you suggest we educate people in, in this whole manner, the public? Oh, no, no. Well, you, educating the public is great because then they can whistleblow if they see things. Going back to what programmers can do, they can whistleblow, right? It's like being a private in the army, right? But the, but the, but the main thing is that the generals are, are responsible for the policy. And, and we can't let AI be like a barrier because it's this magic thing between th that blocks the generals from being uh, in, in trouble. Well, well, one fascinating statistic for me that always blows my mind is that there's around 700 people that are in the forefront of AI and moving that technology forward. Around 70,000 people who understand what those people are doing and 7 billion people who are affected by, by the outcomes of that work. And how do you, you know, match that up with, with government? Who is gonna be making those policies? Is someone who barely understands? You know, I work with data scientists on a day-to-day -day basis. They can't explain to me how our algorithms work and they're not nearly as complex as some of the other ones changing people's lives. How do you deal with that? How do you create legislation that, you know, creates a, out of a black box algorithm but, that spits out an answer and people think. But I would think, argue when you get too much of a disconnect between regulators um, and technology companies, did you watch the Facebook hearings? Uh, um, there was a great meme around the office with all the millennials. It was basically like, oh my God, Mark Zuckerberg is explaining the internet to his grandparents, right? right? I mean, that's how people felt. And we really want that divide to grow, right? I mean, I personally think that, you know, you're right, I also, run an AI company. Um, I also have data scientists explain things to me that I don't fully understand. But I think it is incumbent upon just us as a population to inform ourselves better, right? I mean, as we've grown as a society, I think we've had to learn about a lot of things that we didn't need to know about five or 10 years ago, right? So I'm not arguing that there should be a regulatory body for AI. That I, I don't know that that's necessary. Um, but I do think that having a more informed whether it's you know government agencies or just the regular population is is going to be a good thing. So yeah, I, I there was an interesting comment in an earlier session today where we were talking about you know technology and the law you know on, on other issues and 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 I don't know if it's right. I'm not. I I have real reticence around an FDA for AI. Yeah, I was you know, advocating for I, it. No, yeah. I, I recognize yep. that, and I'm just sharing your. Yep. Gosh, I don't know if that's the best yep. approach to do it because I also don't know if a single body, yep. you know, just as a police department may not be well prepared to make decisions around recidivism tracking and prediction mm -hmm. software, whether a single body would be sufficient, um, you know, to to. To, to do so for all of the places where, where decisions would need to be made. But the, the comment that was made was something along the lines of, you know, essentially the law sets the, the definitions of, you know, what the, what the sandbox looks like. And then how we work within that sandbox, right, is, a, is where innovation and, and interesting things can happen. And that sounds like that's what's happening in the, automotive in the automotive industry, right? We know what the rules are, and then within that we can innovate. And to the extent then that the law needs to be changed or updated or whatever, we can have that, we can have that discussion. I don't think this is a question where, you know, a, a whole new legal framework needs to exist. 
On the other hand, I also think, though, that you can't let policymakers take a pass. Hmm. You know, it's it's the the the. the the really spectacular woman who's you know running Estonia these days was in an earlier session was talking about like this is actually leadership you know where mm -hmm. you you figure things out and then you 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 make some decisions based on 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 what you know and so I think one of the questions that we really have to get better at is are we asking the right questions because I think the thing that scared everybody about the Facebook hearings was people didn't even know how to ask the right questions. <laughs> yeah. You know, right. it wasn't that people were yeah. somehow or another confused right. over complex <laughs> right. data structures right. or, you, you know, deeply nested <laughs> right. enterprise systems. Right. They were they were confused over the basics. They were confused over how And they didn't Facebook know how to ask, yeah. you know, the right the questions. questions. And yes. so I can imagine a police department, I don't know why we're picking on law enforcement, but yep. we've gone down this road, so I'll <laughs> stick with it. But you know, I can imagine a police department at least knowing how to ask enough questions where they have a level of comfort, where if something goes sideways, you go back and you can say, oh, this was actually pretty good due diligence. We learned something through that process, but it's not like we just, we just signed on the, on the dotted line and said, okay, and then washed our hands of the results. Okay. And what we can we can continue a second. I just want to make sure that we give the audience a chance to get involved because um, there may be some some great questions out there. Anybody want to raise their hand and, and uh, fire a question yeah. at the the audience? If not, oh, okay, gentleman here at the front. Just wait for a microphone. Hi, I'm uh, Leslie Nutzbaum. I'm the co-founder of Humanizing Autonomy. Uh, we predict. Uh, pedestrian behavior for self-driving cars to uh, drive more safely through urban environments. <laughs> Sorry, what was your company called? Uh, humanizing Autonomy. Humanizing. And uh, we've been asked by defense companies, law enforcement companies, yeah. uh, to recognize certain behaviors in the streets, yeah. such as fighting or using a weapon. Yeah. And I actually thought that through AI you can also remove human bias. So if this um, prediction algorithm does not take into account, for example, ethnicity, yeah. but just pose or object recognition, you can use that same system to make decisions that perhaps a human decision maker would not make or falsely make. Right. So I was wondering whether you also have positive <laughs> thoughts on the use of AI uh, well, this is, re this is kind bias. of, right, this is what Frida's working on, essentially. Yeah, right? I mean, I think there are a lot of, uh, maybe not a lot, but a growing number of startups that have exactly that same philosophy, which is that you can use AI to reduce human bias in whatever process it is that you're looking at, right? And I think video interviewing is another one that's really interesting because, um, again, human interviews are very subjective. You know, people that are better looking than others get jobs, uh, even though it's not really related to their job performance. What if you could remove the beauty bias from some sort of a system, right? So I think that there's lots of examples like that um, that are counter examples to negative ones, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, we decided not to go for those kind of assignments because we thought it was too controversial for mm -hmm. us to involve in making those kind of decisions. So we focused only on normal pedestrian behavior so that cars can just drive more safely. But then the difficulty is um, if a government sets regulations, that's all good and fine. But if the data is not there for an AI system to learn of, then it's still really difficult to make an unbiased uh, system. Yeah. Imagine uh, wheelchair users in a city are just mm. less right. recorded, right? Yeah. So if, the, if there's less wheelchair data, then autonomous cars will not yeah. be able to respond to wheelchair yeah. users as mm -hmm. easily. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about governments spreading data sets mm. that they feel are well representative of an environment? Interesting. That, yeah, that I, uh, so uh, Bath is actually apparently the second big si best city next to Chicago for, re for uh, releasing its data, which I feel two minds about again because of GDPR and privacy, but anyway, we, we are very good at quite a lot of, actually there's, people were saying rude things about GDPR in that same session, and I, I was really angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because Europe actually has done a fantastic job of saying everything that's not private, we're gonna share. We're gonna make an API across the whole thing, and they solved that in less than 12 months. They are making massive, fantastic progress because they are trying to compete with America and, and American AI. 
So there's some very cool stuff happening in, Brit in not Britain, unfortunately, in the EU uh, <laughs> about, about uh, okay pulling, uh, uh, pulling data together for this kind of thing. However, I, and I, so firstly that, secondly that uh, there's people who say that maybe since data is about the world, it's something that can't be owned and maybe we need to nationalize the databases. That's another thing I've heard. But I've never heard of somebody going out and proactively making a database like what you're discussing, because you're right, you'd be crazy to go in a wheelchair in a lot of places. And so we're having to create a new database. And I think that's a wonderful role for government, but I haven't heard of it before. Although I suppose it'd be spun out to an NGO. <laughs> that's a great idea. Okay, um, well, this gentleman I think was first. Hi, thanks for the panel. Um, I'm in the health AI space. And one of the nuances in, in healthcare, like with many other industries is that uh, it's, it can be really difficult to disentangle these vulnerable data points. You know? mm -hmm. On one hand, you don't want someone's gender or socioeconomic background to drive the predictions, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, we know that mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. data are really well correlated to yeah. people's health outcomes. Yeah. So how do you make an AI system aspirational uh, in a sense? You know, the, a system that can try and overcome some of the historical biases in, in something like the healthcare system without completely ignoring what are really valuable data points? Great question, yeah. I, uh, again, I'll just whack into two ideas. It's not the AI system that's aspirational. You're the one that's aspirational and you need to put the pieces together. The, the aspirational is a human thing. Uh, but go ahead. What I, I was also gonna say that, I mean, if a, if a a gen a gender or ethnicity or socioeconomic status is being used to make outcomes for patients more equitable, then I, I would argue that that data should be used, right? I mean, it's all about the outcomes being equitable, mm -hmm. if that Lauren, makes sense. Right? But there's also, so, so we're going to yeah. get all sorts of yeah. opinions and I don't on know, this. This isn't my area of expertise, but mine either. But, yep. you know, I also look at it and I say, okay, well, if, if, if in this example, women have poor outcomes, is the assumption that women are less healthy and then there's implications for the availability of insurance or whatever the case may be, or is it that women have not had access to a healthcare system in the past that would have led them to have similar outcomes to someone else that had had access to the medical system up until that point in time? And so I think, Joanna, and I am not a data scientist nor a computer uh, engineer and a computer scientist, but it, it strikes me that you could then design systems, right, that controlled for you could design an AI system that would allow us to um, evaluate, depending on the aspirations that the that you have with regards to that. You could control. You could try to control for some of those things, and then yeah. make decisions. Yes. Well, lots lots of this is just basic statistics, and it's about going out and controlling things well. And whether you do that with a machine or not is irrelevant. Um, I did want to say that the, one of the things that drove me most insane was finding out until the 1980s that they didn't in America, or maybe it's the 70s, but they wouldn't allow you to run medical experiments, drug experiments on women because the results were different. <laughs> okay. It's oh, like, man. oh yeah, so, so medicine was only for men. Yes. It was, huh. It's unbelievable. You know? so, so yes, there are these differences, but what, what does frighten me is the number of people that say, oh, therefore we need to eradicate privacy. So yeah. it, we need to think about ways to allow uh, every person and to get this kind of information out anonymized so that we could do the good science, but we don't actually need that many people to do that. And then we need to have individuals have control of their own stuff and then use the models that your kind of company would build. Right, so let's try, try and take a couple more questions. Yes, this gentleman here. That's, uh, actually, in the front, I, I was. Thank you, uh, panel. Thank you for great perspectives. Uh, my, uh, just building on one of the themes that was discussed, which is accountability, uh, on, the, uh, on the flip side of the coin are monopolies, and especially when we talk about large, uh, large companies like Facebook, Google, that have these massive data sets that, you know, small, small fellows like us can never, uh, never get to. What is the panel's thoughts on limiting that monopoly, uh, perhaps a patent type uh, infrastructure, legal infrastructure, where you have those proprietary data sets are only for so long. And um, before I turn it uh, over to you, one thing that, that's worth mentioning is the reason why we're looking for analogies like that is uh, 
you know, for example, FDAs for AI or patents for data sets is because this is such a novel, it's a new world, and yeah. therefore why we're here. Uh, but so passing it on to you. Let's, let's bring in Robert. You're obviously not as big as Google or Facebook, but I think you'd probably like to be. Would you I, like I would to love it if their data sets were public, <laughs> but uh, I don't think that's going to happen. You know, I see a future where individual citizens have full control of their data, and they determine what they want to share and for what causes. Because we're, we're kind of putting AI in a, in a negative light here, but there are so many positive things that could be done if that data was uh, standardized and shared publicly. A lot of new startups, it would level the playing field, uh, take away a bit of that duopoly, monopoly type of action that the big players are having. Um, so that's the kind of future I see is where people have some sort of system where they can determine what they want to share with uh, and with what kind of companies. Should we not have data monopolies? It is, it is the case that these very, very big companies are, you know, their power is just being compounded by the amount of data they have. Is there, does that seem un-American, un unfair to do? What was the to, first to, to, to try and, uh, try and uh, regulate the Well, I'm monopolies. European, so the un-American is not necessarily a bad thing. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm also, uh, I like thinking about the future being more of a level playing field. And, and the way it's going right now, it's just going to continue concentrating the wealth and the, and the sort of the power in, in the hands of a few. Data is the new oil, they say, and I, I absolutely know it's true. In the advertising space, the more data you have, the more money you can charge to an advertiser, the more relevant the advertising becomes to end users who are, who are seeing the ads. So um, sharing that in the long run, I think, is a, is a, is a good thing for society yeah. as a well. whole. So I just want to let this gentleman two seats behind you get his question in as well. My name is Yabba Fantae, and I'm from the African Institute for Mathematical Science. So mostly I work on the research aspect of AI. So um, the question f for me is that, like when we have two, the algorithm and then the data, and the data is already existing data, so we're not training on a future data. So that means whatever is biased already is in the data. And then there is the algorithm, which is we are putting our, um, our thoughts and including some of the trainings and co could incorporate also cultures and other aspects, so the algorithms becomes biased as well. So, and given that the bias is not also known uh, a, a priori, so that means you cannot take into account those biases uh, in the algorithm, right? So fundamentally, you're going to have a bias one way or another. So one way is, of course, just is to, to, to look at the asymptotic nature or the future uh, aspect in such a way that you empower people, for example, if it's gender, then you, you make an actual world, if it is like equal, then you would assume that the AI would also go into uh, such matter, right? So the data becomes, there will be more data accessible, and then the algorithms, uh, and also there will be lots of people from different backgrounds, different cultures, coming and coding or putting the, those algorithms in such a way that the AI will no more biased in that sense. So that's what my aspect. How can, you, how can we try to, just knowing that we cannot correct a priori, right. how can we try to design policies or any guidelines in that aspect? Well, other, that, okay, other, that's a good, that's a good question. The second question I'm going to put is okay. that AI is going to be the same as nuclear power in the past or other, uh, other um, important uh, revolutions. So in that aspect, we have seen, at least from the past, that the key players would determine and certain things would be limited. For example, if it's a climate uh, game, then you know we can impose certain climate um, restrictions. But some already benefited from the system, and some others didn't. So right. how can you tr try to then balance and correct also the kind of you know uh, problems we have seen in the future? Okay, in the past? that's a good. Well, so it's a good good um, way to to sort of maybe try and. Uh, wrap things up and, and, and sort of focus our, our thoughts a little bit here. So I, I'd like for everybody to, to give their advice, their thoughts on what, what we should do as a society, what we should do policy-wise, and what we should do internationally. I think that's a good, a good question. You know, it's, it's, it's going to become an increasingly international issue. So who wants to, to dive into that? Robert. I, I, I would say I absolutely agree with Joanna that the EU is doing a, a, you know, a bang up job leading the way. What we need, I feel, is a global sort of GDPR equivalent. We need mm -hmm. to be 
on the same page globally because say that America comes up with, with its response to GDPR, China um, and whatnot, we need to, as a society, as a, and I say society, as a, you know, one world, decide what are the rules, how are we going to move forward with this and try to stay, you know, one step ahead inst instead of being retroactively trying to fix things because as an entrepreneur, once you slap legislation and, and you know, policies on me, I have to adhere to that, but it's very cumbersome and it stifles progress. So keeping in mind that AI can be a very powerful and positive thing and uh, trying to figure out how to facilitate that. That's a really interesting idea. I think like how you would also manage those sort of um, different ethical standards exactly. internationally would be, would be kind of interesting. And that's actually something that the forum has been, has been thinking about. Um, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the parting thought that I would leave us with, just from, from my perspective, is there is tremendous promise in these tools and what we can learn and the impact that um, we can have if we, if we do this well. Mm -hmm. And um, while I, you know, look, I've spent my entire life in the, in the technology sector, I'm, I, I, I like technology just for the sake of technology. On the other hand, I also want to make sure that as we are applying that technology, just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should. And the question as to how should we, when should we, who should be involved in helping making those decisions, I think are still um, are, are not well answered. And I don't want to impede progress, but I also want to make sure that there is a parallel ongoing conversation that encourages us to take a look at the, the context in which we are deploying these tools um, so that we make sure that we realize the promise that sits before us. Okay, Frida. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add other than I think it's just such an unknown that we're going into mm -hmm. that I think um, just like the machine learning models we build, we need to kind of make sure they're dynamic and ever changing on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's just kind of our thinking around this has to evolve in that similar way because I think something we say today could be completely wrong. Yeah. You know, yeah. tomorrow or three months from now, a year from now. So I'm just basically not going to have an opinion because I think it'll <laughs> very short, short very shelf sensible. life. <laughs> okay. Okay. Joanna. Um, well, I, I'm actually, the, I'm going to want to say something positive about that last question about the, 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 uh, the skewing of the global situation. I think that the AI one may possibly be not as bad as the climate one in terms of who already got the advantage of burning a lot of carbon. Um, because globally inequality is actually dropping and a lot of that is to do with technology and access to information so that farmers can know what's a fair price to demand for what they're making and what's a good thing to build and how the weather is going to be. And so some of the advantages of the information age are spreading better because of the nature of technology. Now that's not to, it's still true that there's all these other kinds of problems, uh, but like that we don't have enough information about certain kinds of people and so then we made, make biased products. Um, also kicking back to one of the earlier questions, uh, I don't know how this is gonna work out. I'm skeptical, but sometimes these things do work out. The EU is investing in making its own data lake as a, pub, as a public asset. And you know, this is the first panel I've been at here that hasn't mentioned China. I want to mention China. Uh, China, I am interested to see what you do about this <laughs> with your data policy. Because again, everyone knows that, that uh, China has access to a lot of data. Everybody believes that the government uh, has a lot of control. I don't know how, how true these kinds of things are. I do know that it's scary uh, if the data that's being used about individuals, like you know, what they're texting each other, winds up affecting those individuals' outcomes um, uh, in, in severe ways. Uh, but anyway, we, do, we need to be thinking about these resources. Yeah, that's great. Well, that, that was a fantastic wrap up from all of you. All that's left for me to say is thank you so much to our guests. Thank you for listening, and please give them all a big round of applause. <laughs>